Chris Gab. Uh, Kenny, I'm just curious. What do you think? What, what do you do here with the front office? Where, where, where are you moving in a different direction? What do you do with Mike Patton? Get rid of it. Blow it up. Let Everything. It, come on. Let's be a Ray Farmer wants to stay status quo and, and continue to build this thing uh, at a two and eight record through ten games. They lost, lost what their last five last year. So that means they're two and thirteen in their last fifteen games. And you look on the field and you see the lack of talent at every position. Every single position, there's a lack of talent. Why the hell would you want to keep Ray Farmer around for another year of having a high, either the number one, two, three, four, or five draft pick in each and every round? Get rid of Ray Farmer, and I'm even considering blowing up Mike Pettin, as well as his O coordinator, his D coordinator. See who's available. Don't just fire somebody to fire somebody, but there's got to be somebody better than Ray Farmer out there and see what other coaches might be interested in this job. Kenny, are you willing to let Ray Farmer's first year go away? No. No, even not if, at even all. Even if he had nothing uh, to do with That's under his watch. Whether he uh, bowed to Mike Pettin for Justin Gilbert, whether he bowed down and allowed uh, the bum and Jimmy Haslam to convince him to take Johnny Mandel. No. Grow a pair, make a decision as the GM, and stand by that. Tell your owner to hit the, hit the road. Do you hire me to do a job? Let me do my job. Hey, Amen. I totally agree. I mean... I- the only guy I can think of is a guy who, you know, was ran New England, did a great job with Belichick. That's Scott Pioli. Everybody's talking about Bill Poli, and that's fine. I say Scott Pioli. What, what are you doing for head coach? Let's just say you fire Patton. What are you doing for head coach? I have to see who's available out there. I, I haven't looked that far down the road yet to see which coaches are available. John Gruden's name's always going to pop up, the Monday night uh, guru uh, and everything along those lines. But, uh, uh, you know, Put a list together. Call everybody and anybody before the season ends. Uh, you know, try and do it behind closed doors without it leaking out. Now, that's hard to do with social media and somebody tells somebody and it gets out there. But you've got to explore every option because the Browns are the laughing stock of the National Football League right now. Kenny, one, one let's go question. back hey. to the last time. Hang on one second. Let's go back to the last time the Browns had to make it higher, okay? You had Lombardi. Uh, and this is truly what I think cost Lombardi and Banner their jobs, was the dysfunction they had in trying to hire a head coach. And I think Jimmy put his hands up when it was all said and done and said, I don't want anything to do with this. We're going to hire a coach. But it's like Jimmy's the guy that's got all the money. He's got the great car. He's got a beautiful house. He's going to give the girl the best dress they should possibly have for any prom date you could possibly have. He has everything and got rejected six times. Not by the most beautiful girl, but even down the road by ugly girls that were just waiting for something better to come along. Do you think he wants to go through that again? He has to. As the owner of this football team, he has to do whatever it takes to get this team back moving in the right direction. And they are not. They're going in the wrong direction. He's the captain of the ship, and the ship is is sailing out to, to sea with no direction whatsoever, and it's going to disappear. So he needs to do whatever he can. I would hire the GM first and then ask the GM who he would like to bring in as a head coach. We're seeing it right now. Petten and Farmer are not on the same page. And Petten was hired before Farmer. And Farmer, why they rushed into Ray Farmer, they were afraid he was going to go to Miami uh, as the only other team that had an interest in him. And we're seeing uh, how that's played out for the Browns in, in making sure they kept Ray Farmer. I go out. I said it last week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago on my radio show. Go bring in right now. As you go into this bye week, go bring in somebody who has helped build an organization. And what I mean by that is they've helped take a team at least to the Super Bowl, preferably win the Super Bowl. Go get that consultant that has no ties to Jimmy Haslam, to Mike Pettin, to Ray Farmer. Pay him whatever you got to pay him. Say, come in over the last six weeks. Look at my team from top to bottom. Give me a written assessment at the end of the season so I can then go in the direction that you think I need to go in. All right, let's uh, go ahead real quick. I got two. Scott Pioli, Floyd Reese. But I, I think you have to look. I, I think that they've made an investment in Johnny Manziel. I think if I'm Jimmy Haslam and I'm watching the game yesterday, I'm pissed because I'm watching what Manziel's been able to do after a couple weeks, and I'm wondering if he couldn't be better. And I'm telling you, you're going to hear Kevin. You're going to hear Kevin Sumlin's name left and right over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to make a bold statement. If Mike Pettin puts Josh McCown back in as a starting quarterback, I believe he will be fired. I, I don't think there's anybody else that would disagree with you on that. Nope. There, there's no turning back. I think Josh McCown's going to be a great backup. I think Josh McCown's the kind of guy Johnny needs around to be able to turn to and say, 
what should I do here? What should I do there? Despite the fact his win-loss record, the guy plays with everything he's got. Right. And you can't take that away from him. I think Josh McCown, I, I'd sign him up next year again to be the backup quarterback. If you're going to keep, no matter what, I don't care if you go out and draft another quarterback. I think Josh has earned his spot on this team for the next year, even if it's the, the grizzly old veteran that can take up one of those three spots of quarterback. Kenny? He is what he has been his entire career, a very good backup quarterback. He's not a starter in this league, and he's gotten a crap beat out of him throughout this season and tried to fight through it, give him credit for that. As a backup, I have no problem keeping Josh McCown around. I don't need to see him as a starter. I even want to see Austin Day before this season is over, too, if Johnny can't do anything over the next few weeks. Give me a look at Austin Day for a game or two. You locked him up for two years, and you're paying him a guaranteed salary. Let's see what Austin Day can do if Johnny doesn't get any wins over the next three or four games. All right, hey, Kenny, we're going to come back to you in a second. I do want to go to uh, Matt Lodi from SteelersGab.com. Hi, Matt, how are you? Hey, guys, good morning. How you doing? Good. Uh, look at all the Super Bowl uh, mini helmets you have back there. Congratulations. <laughs> it's good to be a Steelers fan uh, today. Your thoughts on yesterday's game? I, I mean, it was kind of basically what I felt it was going to be. I thought the Steelers' offense would be able to dominate what was a pretty bad and what will be bad the rest of the year, a Browns defense. I do think what's interesting is this was kind of very similar to the way the Browns played Cincinnati. I thought the Steelers... Uh, you know, I thought the Browns would hang around. I, I did. I thought they'd hang around for about a quarter, maybe a quarter and a half, and then the Steelers would kind of take over. That's kind of exactly what happened. Uh, you know, right before the end of the half, that series of plays, Steelers, no fear. They're down uh, within the Browns, what, three, two, three-yard line. They go for it on fourth down. Ben throws a really bad pass. And then they go three and out, get the ball back, and then the uh, the, the touchdown of Martavis Bryant, which was just like a, a fly ball of progressive field. That thing took forever to come down, and, you know, it just shows you guys again, and you guys all know this. We've watched every Browns game this year. The Browns are just outmatched defensively just to buy about any football team that has any semblance of an offense. And, you know, the Steelers said, hey, you want to put eight men, nine men in the box and shut down our run game and, you know, not be embarrassed by D'Angelo Williams? We'll throw the ball all day. And, you know, even if Ben wasn't in that football game and Landry Jones wouldn't have gotten injured, I still had confidence the Steelers had, Steelers had enough firepower to win that football game. And, uh, certainly they did. I mean, 30 points, that's exactly what the Steelers want to score on a weekly basis. And uh, while I thought Johnny Manziel played a decent football game, I think Pierre said it himself, he only scored nine points. And, you know, even though you put up 330, 340 yards passing, you got to score more than nine points. I think the penalties, the turnovers, the sacks, all of that combined for a pretty dismal effort by the Browns. All right, so uh, again, how do you hold that against Johnny Manziel? If you're giving up seven sacks, you've got Duke Johnson – can't hold the block. Cam Irving looked like he was a guy that started his first game. And still, I think people walk away from this thinking Manziel played well yesterday. I don't know if I could say he played well, Andy, only because, again, you, you as a quarterback, you're the, you're the maestro of that offense, and you, you have to find a way to get other guys involved. If guys like Duke Johnson and whatnot are dropping the football, you know, I thought that they tried a couple times to do some things. I, I know that, you know, Travis Benjamin – on the one long play early in the football game, that looked like a play that, you know, would kind of spark this offense a little bit. I'm not saying Manziel played great. I am not also saying he played terrible. I thought he played a little bit above average. I mean, we've seen plenty of football games, if you've covered the NFL or watched the NFL over the year, where guys throw for 350, 370 yards, and they still lose. Uh, what I'm disappointed in is how this team reacted from the standpoint of stupid penalties again, uh, Armani Bryant, I, I think that's his third or fourth very dumb penalty this year. I mean, I thought there was a game earlier this year he had a personal foul or he did something stupid that cost his team points. He did it again yesterday. Um, you know, it's these veteran players that are making mistakes, and I think that's where you're going to have to call into question the heart of this football team. I heard uh, you guys talk a little bit earlier about the Browns not quitting, not quitting. I'm not saying they're quitting. But are they at a point right now where, you know, you almost kind of in a way want to see them, uh, you know, want to see what this team has left because you've got to figure out, you've got to weed out the good from the bad. And I'm not saying the good from the bad from a talent. I'm saying the good from the bad from the heart standpoint because I watch this football team, and, and at this point you just know bad things are going to happen on a weekly basis. The penalties, the turnovers, I mean, some of that stuff's got to be on Mike Patton because this team looks awfully unprepared on a weekly basis and some of that's got to be on the coaching staff for the way that they run training camp, from the way that their things went early in the season to how things are going right now. All right, Matt, what do you got on Steelers, Gab? Well, we're talking obviously about yesterday's win. The Steelers, like the Browns, have the bye week. <laughs> Certainly a very different outlook 
than the Browns right now. We're looking ahead at the schedule. The Steelers come back with a huge game in two weeks in Seattle against the Seahawks team that really went back and forth with the Cardinals last night. And then it's all AFC after that. They've got the Browns again, the Bengals again on the road. They've got Denver at home and Indy at home. So, and they got Baltimore on the road on a Sunday night. So a lot of big football left for the Steelers. And this is a 6-4 and four football team that, in my opinion, they've got to win four out of their last six in order to go to the Super Bowl. Or Super Bowl. Go to the playoffs, rather. They've got to do a lot to go to the Super Bowl. I don't think anybody's beaten New England, to be perfectly honest. But they've got to go, in my opinion, four and two in their last six to go to the playoffs and maybe try to get the fifth or sixth seed in the AFC because I don't think anybody's reaching Cincinnati at this point in the All AFC. All right, Matt North. Lodi, Steelers Gap, thank you so much. Always appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you, you soon. Too. Let's just quickly go to the phone lines. Jeff in Moreland Hills. Hi, Jeff. Hi, gentlemen. How are you? How are you doing? Uh, I kind of agree with Pierre. They've quit. And the Browns, if you watch them, they're the Smurfs. I mean, you're watching tiny little wide receivers in one of the 411. You're watching corners that are small. And Johnny Menzel has no hope in the NFL at his size. My wife's saying he should get a ladder behind the line. Well, what do you think of Drew Brees? uh, uh, Do you like Drew Brees? This isn't Drew Brees. I'm asking you, uh, do you like Drew Brees? It's the same height. You're talking about height. You're not talking about anything other than height, right? I like Drew Brees. I like Russell Wilson, but I don't like Johnny Menzel. He's a distraction to the team. He doesn't have the talent. And you look at Ben, Ben Roethlisberger yesterday. He at, at will, you saw that size, and you saw him get it over the, the lineman. Uh, I'll give it to you. I mean, we've talked about height time and time again. There, there's nothing he, he can do. He, he I think proved. that if you talk about Johnny Manziel, he's been coached. He showed that he's coachable when it comes to football. The off-the-field stuff is what the off-the-field stuff is. And if that's a, it's still an investment in a first-round pick, I'm just not willing to just throw it away without seeing what he's got for the rest of the season. If he sucks for the next couple of weeks, then he sucks, and that's the end of it, and you move on to next year. But – Still, I, you got two wins. You got nothing to lose by playing it for the rest right. of the year. Who's he going to throw to? How, what? What do you see? This is ridiculous. Yesterday, I'll go through all the receivers that made catches yesterday. Travis They're Benjamin had 113 tall. yards, seven receptions. Andrew Hawkins had seven receptions. Brian Hartline had six receptions yesterday. Gary Barnage had six receptions. There are guys to throw to. He and I think the thing where you you look and see how has he improved. I think in the beginning, the only guy he was looking at was Travis Benjamin or right. the primary receiver. He Yesterday was the nine, first time he was he looking off points, guys. He was Andy. making some good reads. And he stepped back he up in the pocket. Points. He distributed the ball nine the way it needs to be distributed. Before, yeah. Say that again? He had nine points last week and no points. In, what, he got sacked before, six he times. He got sacked six times. I, it's, it's crazy. Jeff, thank you for the phone call. We appreciate it. Thanks for calling Dogs on the Run. Thanks, man. Jeff's probably not happy with me. Um, oh, well. What do we do? Jackie's here. Hi, Jackie.